thank you all for um, coming to this workshop, improving recruitment, international recruitment results through market segmentation. And I feel like that sounds like a very like marketing-y, business-y speak title, and it is technically. But this is literally one of the most important things that um, I have started seeing universities doing, and when we're working with universities, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself, uh, to actually be able to make better decisions about how to spend their money, how to spend their time, how to really focus. And I can tell you that, you know, for, so I'm Megan Brenwhite. I'm the founder of the Brenwhite Group. And we're a small company based in the US, but we work primarily with non-US clients. So all higher education, lots of German universities. I was the deputy director for Day a Day in New York. So I was, those of you who know Peter Kerrigan, I was his predecessor in that office responsible for marketing German higher education. I represented the universities of the state of Hessen. I was director international at Parsons School of Design. And I actually have been working with websites and study abroad since 1997. So I was you know, one of the people who learned HTML and had to do all these things to start talking to people in different languages, different continents right away. So this is a long time that I've spent thinking about how to really talk to people in different countries, how to explain what is important about your institutions or programs. And it's really, so this is, this to me is, it's like an hour and 15 minutes is gonna be just a taste of it, I think. And I really wanted to make it um, a workshop. So everybody should get out your pens and paper now, if you don't have it, pens and paper time. Because we're gonna we're gonna go through something that is can seem a little bit complex, but I think that um, it can either seem so easy that it's just obvious and you wonder why we're talking about it, or so complex that it seems almost impossible to you know take on all of these different segments. So we're gonna just dive in here, and hopefully by the end of this journey together you will also be a believer in why this is important, why even the thought exercise about the market segments is important. Okay, so the best marketing on earth, right? It would be a product that is 100% designed for me with marketing that's designed for me, that's exactly how I want it, but like I said here, even my husband can't really find like an awesome birthday present for me every year. You know, so that's like a segment of one person. My husband has to find, you know, please, one person, me. But you have to do research and come up with a successful plan to be able to successfully serve the needs of that market segment. The point of this is that it's not enough to simply define your market segments. You have to also try and find out what are their tastes, how do they want to be reached, what time do they want to be reached, at what stage in the process are they. So think about if my husband, and I'm not saying he did this, but he did, hadn't bought me a birthday present in the morning of my birthday. So how successful would he be at serving the needs of his market segment if he gave me a birthday present in the evening of my birthday because he very obviously forgot to go out and get one the 12 months before. <laughs> Not so great. So there's the element of time also, or the, the stage you're at in the customer journey. So this is just like, I'm gonna try and like, I'm trying to use a metaphor here. Not my birthday present, don't worry about that. Now I just tell my husband what to get or I order it on Amazon and make sure it's delivered on time. But um, I'm gonna try and use another metaphor uh, to make this make sense. But before we even jump into this, I want, you guys, I want you guys to think for a minute about if I gave you $1,000 or euros, whatever currency you want to do it, and 10 extra hours, how would you spend it tomorrow to improve your recruitment results? So just like, think about it for one second. And you could write something down too. You could say like, I would spend it all fixing the website, I would spend it all on Google AdWords for India, I would, Whatever. Nobody's writing anything. Thinking. Good. And if you can't answer that question, just write a question mark down. 
let me just say that we're going to come back to this. So something. This is part of the reason because we get asked. So I do. So with the business that that we have now, we do a lot of work with universities on branding, on strategy, on optimizing their websites, but also on advising them on how do you spend best spend your money and time, and what. The reason I'm so become so obsessed with market segmentation is that I I can't do it properly. I can't actually write good website copy if somebody says, "Oh, we want every international student." You know, "Oh, it's for all of our programs." "Oh, we want no, we want the people who want to do the doctorate and the ones who want to go in industry." Like when it's too broad, all of a sudden you go, "I have no idea how I would spend my $1000 and my 10 hours." It's it's really hard. So this is the metaphor that I hope will work for you guys. I tested it yesterday on one of my website check victims. So um, I think with illustrations, it will be even better. Uh, so if we're talking about shoes, right? So I just picked random shoes. These here we got some little, these are running shoes. These are soccer shoes. These are little sporty running shoes. And here we've got a bunch of different people. Like she's a professional sports player, she's just a you know stylista, an older athlete, et cetera, right? So here we've got products and customers, right? So shoes, if we're gonna take this metaphor into higher ed, because I think this is like really obvious when you think about something like shoes. You're like, of course you can't sell women's tennis shoes to a male professional runner. And yet, that's what happens all the time in higher education. People are trying to sell the wrong, that's a, you know, a different topic as product market fit, but they're trying to sell a product to people who don't want or need it, or else they don't even know who wants or needs their product, or else they say, we want people from these countries, even though the natural interest is from these countries. So it makes it 10 times harder to get it. So this is, okay, so this is my metaphor. So if you think about the country of manufacture, Nike shoes, these are not mine, American shoes, that would be German higher ed. So somebody thinks of something when they think of American shoes maybe, a German car, whatever it is. So there's something that's gonna be in a prospective student's mind when they think about Nike shoes versus Adidas versus Puma, whatever. German higher ed. They're going to be, there's going to be something in their mind when they think about you in that context. The city of manufacture and design. With Nike, I don't think it's important. It's made in Portland. But there are shoes that actually, like, Doc, I think aren't Doc Martens from, like, Liverpool or something like a working class city? There are places where the city would matter. And I would argue the same is true for universities. Some places it matters. Some places it matters less. The general type of shoes. So here you have your sports shoes is our big category. That could be your faculty, right? So you're like history and Wissenschaft and social sciences, sports shoes. Like I still am not going to decide just to buy sports shoes, am I? Not really. Like I'm not going to just go to any faculty and study any program they offer. I'm going to get a specific type of shoes, like soccer shoes. So that could be your Fachbereich. So if we're in social sciences, then I could be in political science, right? The very specific type of shoe, a women's soccer shoe, could be the type of program. I know I want to do a master's program. So I don't care if political science has summer programs or doctoral programs. I'm looking for a master's program. And then the very, very specific type of shoe would be you know, Nike Mercurial Velocity 3 which is the program. So I want to do the Masters in International Political Economy. And you need to be thinking about all of these things as part of your product. That's all part of it. It's part of what you're selling. And I'm just going to use those words here. They're easy. And again, when you talk about shoes, it's really comfortable to talk about selling and customers and products. But I think this, I think this makes a lot of sense. So what are you marketing? This is the most important question. So some of you, how many of you are responsible for marketing one program? Yeah, a good number of you. How many of you are responsible for marketing all of the programs in a Fachbereich? A couple of hands. How many are responsible for a faculty? One hand. How many for the whole university? Yeah. 
So that's already really different. What you guys are selling is really different, a university versus a program. So as long as you know, so if those of you, so just for a second, get real clear, what are you selling? And that's it. And those of you who are doing a whole university, I would argue that you're actually, you, you need to eventually get more clear. Are you selling the whole university? Are you selling the English language experience at that university when we're in this context or the foreign language experience? So what I want you to do is just write down your product. So just say it's your university, it's your program, whatever it is. Whatever it is you guys are trying to market to international students. And then write down all those different things, country, city, type. If you, I mean, you don't have to write it down if it's really boring. If you want to then just go to the next question, think about what your primary current challenge is for marketing that, and what, how do you define your target audience? So I'm gonna give you guys like four minutes to do this. It's something that you could sit and have a brainstorming session for you know, two days with colleagues. But just do it for now, like whatever comes to the top of your mind. How do you define your product? How does it fit in with the university? Biggest challenge, target audience. you don't define it, if you don't have a formal definition, which almost nobody does, <coughs> German universities at least, then I would say just come up with who do you think you're trying to reach. Or international. Sorry, specific. So here we go. So here we have, now we'll go back to the shoe metaphor. So now you know, like, are you guys, are you, who, like, who's selling soccer shoes? You know, you're all selling German higher education, right? Some of you are selling soccer shoes. Some of you are selling this particular shoe. That's like, that's what we kind of talked about. So the way that you break up segments is usually in terms of, and I'll give you the, the definitions, but in terms of demographic and psychographic characteristics. Demographic, most people have heard of. Um, again, I'll give you the definition. So it's like age, gender, just like the basic definitions about a person. Psychographic are their values, their aspirations. So this is really obvious, right? Like a basic, although actually now that I say, now that I say this is really obvious, gender is probably the one that is least obvious now in terms of current discussions you know, and debates. But, Let's just say for the sake of Nike selling shoes, gender is still an important characteristic, regardless of how people identify. Somewhere they're gonna decide if they want women's shoes or men's shoes or unisex shoes, whatever it is. So here we go. So here are our customers. Here are all the women, here are all the men, right? All of a sudden, here are the scientists, here are the humanities people. If these are scientists, you don't need to worry about them if you're selling a humanities program. You know, if, if you're, if yours is, if your program is super applied and you think that men are more likely to want to do applied things, you might start to talk to the men in your group differently than the women. 
there are, there are characteristics about each of these segments, and we'll get them more complicated, that will begin to impact your website, how you communicate via email, how you talk to students at fairs, because it is a much more nuanced understanding instead of just a bunch of anonymous students. So gender is one way to break it down. Age is another. So here's like the very young ones, the you know middle old ones, and here's an older one. Age for universities can impact your stage of life and even sometimes your educational attainment. Not always. But you use, I mean, this is like where it becomes obvious if Nike selling shoes to young people. Like, what channels would Nike use to sell shoes to young people? Like, think about like social media, for example. Yeah. Instagram. Yeah. What else? Snapchat. What about young people in China? <laughs> WeChat, yeah, like yeah, exactly. What would it? What would Nike use to sell to this guy who looks like he's in his seventies? Which I know because I took that picture. <laughs> exactly. It might newspaper ads is what she said. It might not even be. It might not even be online. Although it's probably Facebook now. Facebook is like skewing so old, but. <laughs> so. Here's the first psychographic one. So for gender and age, we all get it. And you all get, like all of this stuff is stuff that you do naturally when you talk to people. When you talk to someone, you naturally tailor the way that you're speaking, the, the, the messages that you talk about a university. It, it just happens. And that's why one-to-one -one marketing is so useful. What we're trying to do is bring that into your e the emails that you send out, the, the website content, try and get it as much of a feeling of being tailored as possible. So this one I put athletic aspirations, right? So like these people are or were professional athletes, these guys don't care about sports, and these guys play sports on the weekends. So you can immediately see how those would be, you'd have a very different ad for each of them, right? If you, if you were gonna run a competition for them, it would probably be different a different kind of competition. What kind of athletic aspirations would you say, what would be the equivalent of aspirations for a prospective international student? There's a bunch I could think of. High performers very much interested in research. Yeah, high performers interested in research. Well, although you don't usually want the low performers. So, so it could be interested in research or interested in just getting a job, earning a bunch of money. Like, that would be a segment, right? It could be, I want to stay in Germany and get a job. I want to go home and get a job. I want to go elsewhere. I want to have an international career. Those are different aspirations. And you could immediately see how a different message is going to work for each of them, right? It's like, I like the shoe thing, you know? So another one could be that like some of them are maybe more value or cost conscious. So like these guys, these guys don't want to spend much at all on shoes. These guys, they don't really care. They have like, you know, they, they're willing to spend a lot. Which means that this is, it, it, it impacts what products they're able to buy. So you cannot, you know, if, a, if, you have a, if there's a program that's 20,000 euros, it can't get marketed to somebody who's super cost conscious. I mean, you can, but you won't, you won't get them. You'll be wasting your time, right? So if, and this is a complicated thing in Germany because as we say, I never like to say that, you know, tuition is free in Germany. It's heavily subsidized by the German government, <laughs> right? That's true. You guys are the taxpayers. You should know that, but it's like, it's not free. It's not like it's worse quality because like they're not paying $30,000 tuition. It's heavily subsidized by the German government or whatever, state government and you know, however you want to like phrase that. So this is like, there are all these different criteria that you can use to, to kind of break down the groups of people. So step number two. So now I want you to like actually start to write down some of the demographic characteristics for the target audience that you chose. And if you've not chosen a target audience by now and something that you're trying to market, this is going to be, you know, this workshop's going to get real dull real quick.
probably obvious, but if you're not also talking to students, if you're recruiting faculty or you're trying to convince the Excellence Initiativa Committee about your university, just take them as the, it's the, exactly the same. That's still the target audience. Uh, where are they located? Okay. Yeah. But that, you know, again, these are just, so that could be, that could mean two things. That could be they're located in Bonn right now. That could be they, you know, go to school in France. They, location is also kind of a subtle thing when it comes to international student recruitment. But I would, I would start with where they are because that is the most important thing for how you reach them. Yeah, not for not not for everyone exactly. That's why our jobs are more fun than other people's jobs. Okay, you guys got some things down. Now I want you to write down just a few psychographic characteristics about your target audiences. What do they want to be when they grow up? What's important to them? Are they like relaxed and cool? We did, I did a talk, I was in London this week talking to um, GMAC, the, they run the GMAT test for business schools and we were talking about how business students are, tend to be more conservative and they probably like to play sports and they, there were all these things that you could come up with for psychographic characteristics that become important later, that seem unrelated to the studies. Yeah. Is there a difference between our values and the grade level for the type group you want to have or the type group in <laughs> actually are, are coming to, to some programs? Do you know, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, no, um, no, I do know what you mean. And, and we're going to talk about how to prioritize the, the markets because that's one of the biggest, that's one of the hardest questions because if, if what you're getting are all students from one country and they, all they care about are rankings and career stuff and what you want are a diverse group of students from all around the world who are really focused on research. There are two issues. One might be your marketing, but the other might really be that you don't attract this market. Hmm. It might be that you're trying to sell women's soccer shoes to male So being re stylistas. realistic, what is is better than and 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 follow follow this uh, line is better than than try to have another target well you're gonna have we're only talking about one segment now just because it's easier but i would you know generally you, you can have three to five I and mean, you could have as many as you want more than three it gets like a little hard to manage but you you have multiple segments. So I would say that the segment that you, it completely depends, and that completely depends on your recruitment goals. I talked about this yesterday to somebody else. Like if you just need 20 people to, we're, yes. If you just need 20 people to fill your program, then like, and you know that the people who are most likely to come are the ones who just want to have like fun in Germany in the summer and are never going to do graduate studies, then you can market to those ones and get 16 of your 20 who are, don't fit your desired profile and still look for the other four. But there has to be, that really are serious and want to come on and do graduate studies. But if it's super hard, you know, you, there has to be an acknowledgement of the kind of cost benefit. Hmm. But ultimately, and I should, I should say this from the beginning, ultimately, the, one of the most important decisions is, it, it's, it's, it's really an academic decision. It's an academic decision and a mission decision for the university. This is not a money decision or a numbers decision. Who do you want in your program is really fundamental. So if you were to say, we want people from you know, 15 different countries who are all um, really committed to interdisciplinary research, and that is the only way this program can run, 
then it would be better to shut the program than not have those people. You know, so it's really about the, this is, this is where it's not like selling shoes. That initial decision is an academic decision, I think. OK, so you all got a few little psychographic characteristics. And this is what I was saying about international students. So, so we're not even, we're location. The demographic question, like location, the things that could impact where somebody sees your marketing, how they perceive your program, how they perceive your marketing, could be influenced by their country of origin, their country of their secondary school <laughs> education, which might be different than their country of origin, the country of origin for their parents, so they may have the values of their parents, their current residents, or, and this is like one of the weirder ones, country or countries that they're currently researching for study opportunities. So if I'm somebody who decided, I definitely want to study in Germany, then I'm only looking at German websites. And Germany will start to make sense to me pretty quickly. If I'm saying, eh, I don't care, I can look all over the world. Or I'm going to look in the US primarily, and maybe I'll see if there's anything else in Europe that's interesting. Then, then that those people are going to quickly get familiar with the US higher education system, and that's how they're going to they're see it through that lens. They're going to understand a PhD program as something you apply for after your bachelor's, a whole bunch of different things. They're going to be surprised when something doesn't cost a lot of money. You know, so this is, you can, I mean, you all know this from your work, right? Or just from being like the people who are probably international. Each of these things influences it. And this is the dimension of time. So now you have one person, like, say, I'm looking for a program. I am American, but I studied abroad in Israel, Germany, the UK, and France. I'm now living in a village outside of New York City. And I was just researching doctoral programs in higher education research so that I could continue to do my job. That's it, right? But it's really different. Like, I have really different needs when I'm just like, I don't know, should I do a doctorate in higher education research? Is it really necessary? You know, we get a ton of business already. It's going to be a lot of time. No, 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 no. Then I'm going to, like, ask friends. I'm going to go on social media. You know, when I'm actually deciding between choices, if I go, OK, I have an offer now from Bath and from Catolica. Now I'm going to really look at like what are, what are the financial conditions, which one's going to be quickest, which one has the best professors that'll get my network. Those are totally different states of mind, right? And this is like this is the this weirdly this customer journey is the thing that's I would say most often overlooked by universities. You kind of assume that like. Not that they're all the same, but that you know that like you just assume that a person is a person. It's sort of like this big mass of people we're trying to recruit, and this is all the stuff they need to know, and it's like all a jumble in our minds. That's what I see, and that's what the websites look like. Do you know what I mean? Like so, that's that you know that's how I I know that this is happening. So they have the same person, different information needs. So if you were going to do like segmentation for like these Nike shoes, so if we just kept up with this, you could say one segment are women between 20 and 40 who are serious but not professional athletes, who are style conscious, and they're in the store ready to buy shoes. What could Nike do, what, what should Nike do to influence that choice? Presentation and display in the store. Exactly. Yeah. Well, here's, here is where it is even more of a great metaphor for your jobs. Guess what, Nike? You don't control the salespeople because they're going to the department and asking about the program and they're picking up the phone and being rude. Just like you're buying the shoes at Foot Locker and Foot Locker can sell a bunch of other shoes. You guys, central people, almost never have the full, ever have the full control over this experience. That's what's hard. So training those people to be friendly, so you could talk to Foot Locker and or the academic department and say nicely, hey, you know, international students often like it when you're not totally rude to them <laughs> and just tell them to go to the website for further information. <laughs> Why don't we, here's a lovely email template that I came up for you that might save you some time, my dear colleague. 
You know, like, so this is like, what, what else could somebody do? Nike. In our modern world, they probably have like weird geo-targeting targeting things on your phone or will soon, where when you're standing in the store, a coupon will like pop up. Maybe not in Germany. <laughs> but, you know, but like this is stuff that's like, that's real. So men over 60 who are serious athletes, cost conscious and researching new shoes. So you can see like, you can see like these are all like legitimate segments and you could probably start to imagine, okay, this is what we would do. This is the kind of ad we would have for them. This is where we would reach them, how we would reach them. But what if, what if like this one is gonna be 90% of the sales? You know, or what if, we don't know, is this, is this like 25%, 25%, 25%, 25% of sales? If we spent our thousand dollars and time, if we divided it between them equally, where would we get the best results? And this, see, this is like, it, I love my shoe metaphor. It totally makes sense. So it's like, who are, we, who are we talking to for university? Prioritizing target audiences is the hardest thing. And this is where it gets back to that idea of like, what are the ones, the people that you want? So let's say Nike says, you know what? These women who are style conscious and, and serious athletes, but not professional, they cost much more for us to get as customers, but they also then blog about it. They post their shoes on Instagram. They have lots of friends. They tend to be influencers. So we're willing to pay $300 for every one of these women to buy a pair of our $40 shoes because we'll get $10,000 of advertising. The equivalent for a higher education is we want people from France on our program because we need that diversity, period, and we're willing to spend more on it. You know, it's like, it doesn't, it's not just, even for a company, it's not just like, we're gonna get the cheapest ones all the time. There are always other factors. So, this is just like, you know, so University of Queensland had, and this is just, I tried to put like some little examples of how you can see segmentation online. This says international students completing year 12 in Australia, international students completing year 12 in their country, international students transferring to UQ, st study one or two semesters at UQ. So these, are, these lead to four different websites. That makes sense, you know? Or four different pages at least. So what would be four market segments? Wait, how much time do we have here? It goes to 11.30, right? Don't say 11.15. Does anybody know? That's awesome. I'll just keep you guys. 11.30, okay, great, 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 great. Okay, so just try and like jot down four market segments using you know, that kind of a thing, like short versions with demographic and psychographic information. 11.45? I thought, I was like, this seems to be going very quickly. Excellent. Or do three if you can't do four. All of you are looking at the screen like you need saving. <laughs> but don't use, don't use these ones. Just look at that. What, you forgot four? <laughs> Jeez. Tough audience. <laughs> I should say also for those of you who work at um, Eat Says around the world, it's the same thing. When we were in, you know, when I was in New York, I had to think about like this is what we, this is how we talk about Germany to the engineering students, and this is how we talk about people who want to do an English taught program, a master's. This is how we talk to people who have um, German heritage. You know, it was exactly you do this stuff naturally. This is just about bringing more rigor to the actual process.
about just like 30 more seconds. A lot of people are still writing. All right, let me just s stop at this point and ask if anybody has any questions or like, you're like, uh, oh, we can't do this. Oh, and the colleague has a microphone there too. Or I can repeat the question, both is possible. Yeah. Um, I'm working in Tokyo in the office in Tokyo from the DAAD and it was really hard for me now to find like segments because you know we promote like studying and researching in Germany so it's pretty much as you said like a whole lot of, of different groups we are talking to so I would just be interested in, interested in how you segmented in the US actually because when I just thought about it okay I could I could go for long-term study abroad and short-term programs but then there are people interested in scholarships or just in studying abroad and then we have the researchers and university corporations so just um, a hint maybe how you managed that. So it was like 16 years ago and we did not do it formally mm -hmm. which is all the years of experience in between have taught me that this is important. Um, and, and most universities don't, by the way. You know, a lot of European universities do not have this formally defined. Now here's the like dirty little secret that I didn't want to stress you out with initially. It is much easier to sell the Nike Veloce 3 or whatever it is than it is to sell the brand Nike. It just is. So that, that's just true. Um, what that means, and I hate to say this to everyone, each program at the very, at the granular level, and you can't do this as DAD, but like each program really needs its own marketing plan, right? It needs to be clear what are the messages, and that would include, even if it's one page, but it would include how do we talk about this program in the context of German higher education? How do we talk about this program in the context of our university? How do we talk about this program in the context of this faculty? So you have to put that program because how you even talk about your city will be different if you're selling a master's in botany or a PhD in um, poetry or a summer program in German studies, right? Totally different because you have different market segments. I think that when it, you're talking about the entire country or you're talking about the entire university and you have to have bigger segments, you do have to at least kind of group the products. So it's sort of like on both sides, you're kind of, you know, you're sort of like, here's product one, here's product two, here's product three. So let's say this is like short term, masters, PhD, whatever. And then here's target A, B, C, D, you're gonna have more basic characteristics. So like this could be, this might be engineers. And an engineer might be interested in all of those, right? So you might have options for all of them. So let's say these are people who are, I know you guys can't really see this, it's more just so like I keep it straight in my mind. Let's say this is people who are research focused. So it's people who are just research focused. So that's a psychographic one. They're going to be interested in the PhD and maybe a summer program if it's research related, right? But you start to like, if you don't, if you can't get this down, everything is just like, bleh. you know, like this is what like websites look like generally. It's like, bleh. Every program, every per you know, so it's like, so that's the thing. It's like you just have you have to decide, and what that means is, so we and we did have a focus. So engineering is one, and so this gets back to that thing. You could sell, I don't know, like luxury fashion programs all day long in France. You can sell engineering all day long in Germany, 
you reverse those two, it gets a lot harder, right? So it's like, so there are some like ones that are just easier and have like a natural, it's like, the, it makes sense. There's a natural group of people who are interested in these programs. And then it's influenced by the country you're in. So let's say in Japan, and this is, this is why segmentation is important. Let's say in Japan, actually what they think of with Germany is the automotive industry and design. Great, so now you have a new segment that we never would have had in the US. You know, but to me, the, the subject is like really one of the first areas for segmentation for universities. Because people identify with their subject more than the university everywhere. Or the, or the country that they're going to study higher education in. And this is exactly, so this gets to exactly this point. How do you prioritize? So there are a lot of different ways you, you, can, you can look and say like, whoa, who do I focus on? Potential market volume is definitely one of them. How many people are there in that market? So let's say you have a luxury fashion program and you're trying to recruit students from France where they have you know, from France and Italy where they have great programs at home, maybe there are like no students that want to come to Germany. But you have a mechanical engineering program and you want to attract students from India and China, you're going to have a lot of potential market volume, right? So to some extent, this can be done on the national basis. And you can, you can look, and we'll talk later about research, but you can look and see what are people studying in which countries, what are, you know, so, and I can just begin to tell you that I have tried to convince some of our clients that when universities are coming up with, when departments are coming up with new programs, they should have a, a very simple exercise that the marketing office offers them as a service, obviously we can't make them do anything, offers them as a service and says, dear academic department, why don't you let us check what the potential market volume is for this program instead of just coming up with a random program and saying, fill it with 30 students, please. Like, I know, this is the way it is. So normally it's, you know, I came up with this program because I got money from the DFG, I got money from the Excellence Initiative, it just is like my favorite interest, and so therefore there's a master's program. Whether or not there's potential market volume is n not usually considered until you're having a problem the level of competition for your product at that segment. So how many of you ha are marketing um, MBAs or have like a business masters? A few. That's like one of the most competitive markets on earth. So if you were to market the MBA, say in the US or the UK where they have a lot of great programs, that's a lot of competition. So you might not want to market that program in that market. Now, if you do this segment more psychographically, and say, we're only looking for students who are interested in international experience for the MBA, all of a sudden you've got some options. You've got some people who you can reach in the US and the UK who might be interested in coming to Germany. Where would somebody, like where might, how could you reach a German, how could you reach a British student who might want to do an MBA abroad outside of the UK? How do you think like the best way to reach them would be? Would it be the same places people advertise like the British MBAs, or that plus something else. Exactly, it's confusing stuff a little bit, right? You, I would ask them, so that's the thing, this is research, I would a literally ask the British students and say, when you were looking to study abroad, did you just go to your normal things like Prospects UK, or did you start to look at things like the Hochschulkompass, or other, you know, or other, the ITSE in your country, or um, studyabroad.com, because it's it gets pretty complicated when you're looking at smaller segments. Now, the good thing is when you're looking at the smaller your segment is, the more specific it is, the better your program is for them, usually the l cheaper it is to reach them because they're small. You're not wasting a bunch of money on reaching you know, the great unwashed masses. And that's this, the cost to reach the customer and convince them to buy. This is one of the ones that also people don't often consider, or sometimes. So I know with my experience that a lot of people would say, a lot of German universities would say, we want students to come from the US, right? So how many of you guys want students from the US? In spite of our horrible, you know, 
How many, how many of you are ready to accept refugees from the United States? <laughs> Maybe it's a better way to put it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. He's in the country right now. Um, so, <laughs> I know. You never know. You, what if we build a wall real quick? <laughs> Skydome, just for Air Force One, never to land again. <laughs> so yeah, so you want to attract a US student, you are literally competing with the most sophisticated and expensive higher marketing, higher education marketing machine in the world. Like the average student at a public university gets something like 19 individual contacts with a university before they decide to buy. The, when you have tuition, of $45,000 a year, you can spend $5,000 to get a student. You guys cannot, right? So like, this is a real thing. So there, there, and there may absolutely be ways to reach US students specifically over, when you have the segments very carefully designed over faculty channels, over word of mouth, through specific academic journals, through multipliers. But reaching them in the, just the general way, it's gonna be super expensive. Whereas going to like Bulgaria or Kazakhstan or China or India, building relationships with people, it's not like it's, not, not like it's free generally, but it might be a lot less expensive for you to get those students. Well, is there, are there possible segments that would be easier to reach? I mean, the, how easy it is to reach them is this factor. So if it's hard to reach them, that makes them less attractive as a segment. So this is where working with a recruitment agent. So if that segment, so I would say if that segment is incredibly important with you, then you would need a company, probably ideally in India, to help you with that, or that you'd say in India, who's really specialized in that. Or you say, you know what, this is like for these five students, I can get five more students from France or something. Not that you can. What's your, wait, what's your program? It's, it's master program, a master program, a master. Okay. So we yeah. have tuition fees and they are working. Oh, right. And I have to be working here. Right. I do right, have right. to address students which come in group and I can tell them. Okay. 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 That's awesome. That's actually awesome. So we talked, okay. So these are master's programs that you have to do while you're already working, right? Yeah, or start working and start the master's program. Work for two years after bachelor. Oh, okay. And then start the master's program. Oh, okay. Quit your job, start the master's program. What, what's the field? Uh, engineering. Engineering. Okay. okay. So how would you guys, what would you, well, this is like, so th let, let's keep going through this because I think this will hopefully become more clear. It's not to say that this is still like, this is, gets like easy once this is done. You know what I mean? Like there's still, it's still hard. And if you have a, a product that, or a location that's not as attractive, which I'm not, I don't know, you know, but like it's, it's harder. But the, the point is, and this is like, this is the next point. Like what's the, of the segments that you guys wrote, what is the priority order? Because this is like the Nike things. Like, so to me, so if you're saying all of your segments are hard, that's, that's a different thing. But if you're like, you know, we have these five segments, these ones are really hard to reach, they go to the bottom of the list. And then what I want you to do for a second is to pick one segment to focus on. So if you want to pick your, the Indian students with a bachelor's degree in their 20s, and you can begin to think of a buyer persona. And this is like, again, could be like a two-day workshop on this. We do these for websites all the time, but this can also be used for market segmentation. So you actually make up a fictional person to represent that market segment. 
and it's just for you. It's not for your website. It's not for any public information. It's literally just to help you see these segments as real humans, right? So it's like, so you say, you know, Jim, who wants to study engineering, who is currently in the UK, whose girlfriend's in Germany, that's like Jim. And then you have, you know, Madhu, who's in India, who's, you know, you just, you literally make up fictional people. And I, it, this sounds like it's silly, but like if you have those people on your wall at work and you think about it and you go, is this gonna be good for Madhu and for Jim and for Karen, our three personas, you'll start to see which ones work for them and what doesn't. This is the University of Hull, by the way. I, I really like their marketing things. This is in the UK. And I just wanted to show you, this is like actually an amazing new relaunch of their website. This is all like a video that plays and changes and is super dynamic. But their whole homepage is all about choose your subject. So that's, the fir that's like the first level of segmentation at a university. Like, look at, I mean, there's one thing you're supposed to do here. <laughs> and here, study, choose whole, work with us. That's it. That's all you can see. All right, does everybody have like one person that they can kind of have in their mind to represent their segment? Okay. So this question is, how many, when you're thinking about that one person, how many months or years before applying does that person begin to research options? Sometimes more than a year or two years or three years. On average. Uh, the beginning of their, if we're speaking about bachelors, I would say beginning of their last year at school. But well, we're speaking about your one target audience persona. So what was your target audience that you were talking about? Jim. Jim, Jim. great. From the UK. From the parents are from the US and Germany. He's in his last year at school and wants to become a man manager. OK. And you want him to apply for? International Business Bachelor. International Business Bachelor. OK. So this is where it's interesting. When do British high school students start to research options? is different than when American or Japanese or other ones start to research college options. And it may be like it's different by a month. It may be that they start, like in the US, they start two years you know, before they graduate. In the UK, I, don't, I actually don't know what that is. But then you realize what are the research questions you need to do to figure out when is Jim looking. Does every high school in the UK have meetings in October of their last year, you know, who are the multipliers for Jim? Do they have, do they have advisors? Do they have college fairs? What websites is Jim going to look at? This is why this is so darned helpful, because if otherwise you just think about the whole world of people looking at bachelors, you might miss it. And I tell you what one of the most interesting, the interesting things about this is Germany, the applications for many master's programs are so late like they're in June or July for October, right? The US is like January for the fall. So if you were trying to reach either US students or students who are also applying in the US and you thought your hot and heavy marketing time for them was like June, you will have missed everybody, literally. You know, so that is the danger of not knowing what your segments are. If you don't care about the US, and or you don't feel like you're competing with the US, doesn't matter. If you do care about it, it really matters. And that's why like knowing, like, knowing that Jim is more important than John, you, gotta, you have to start making some hard choices. And then you get to like, who are they talking to? Like in China, they're talking to recruitment, you know, you know recruitment agents they're not even talking to necessarily. Like, I, was, I was interviewing students in China the other day for a, um, a, uh, what do you call it, pathway program, an English program where they come and they learn English and then they go on to school in the US. Those students don't even look at the websites of the pathway program because they trust the recruitment agent so much. 
So literally, they were like, we don't even look at the website. The recruitment agent tells us this is where you should apply, and we do it. So it's like real different behavior. So we don't have to do this because you guys have like, you know, it's already like a little warm. You've done a ton of exercises already. But I want you to think about like this basic message, which I swear to God I would find on every one of your websites mm -hmm. in some variation, right? Our university is committed to training. Oh, sorry, I forgot a word. Responsible future global leaders through a combination of cutting edge research and close ties to academic institutions and companies around the world. Like some version of that is everywhere on all the websites, FHA, Research University, Art Academy. I mean, it's like really the same. So now, how would you revise this for your chosen segment? That's what's, this is what gets kind of interesting. Because this is what you have to do. You have to think about your university's mission and how you change it to talk to the individual segments. So who, who else had a different segment that they, can I, does anybody else feel comfortable naming their segment or their persona? No. No, all right. All right. OK, so let's say, well, OK, I'll, so I'll take one that we talked about yesterday. Let's say we had somebody who was a, um, a student from Korea. They were 18. They were just coming to Germany for a fun summer program that may or may not be about European studies, may or may not be in one of Germany's most well-known student cities. So for that person, like all of that's irrelevant, right? It would be like located in the most beautiful part of Germany with easy airport access to Berlin and Paris and blah, blah, blah. You know, our university will provide you a safe and nurturing environment to earn credits while you make friends from around the world. Right? That's like a totally different thing. But this is us being like, bleh. Bleh. You know, like this is like kind of meaningful to nobody. <laughs> Sorry. I work on a lot of copy for higher ed. So this stuff, all of it, all of it's important. You know, this is relevant for the emails, for the scripts, for the digital advertising. So even when you're thinking about like how you reach a student from India, if it's hard to reach them, at the very least what you can control is what you say on your website and understand what's important to them. And that at least can help. So even if it's hard to figure out how do, do, how do we do social media in China if we don't have a presence there, at least you can make sure that you have things that are relevant for Chinese students on your website and in your brochures. And that can really help. And I really, I wanted to show you guys some, eh, we might have time for this. Um, but this is like this ridiculous thing called GeoFly. And they have this video about uh, geotargeting for websites. And it's software. This was people who worked at a university in the US who developed this. It's software that somehow goes on top of your website. It doesn't impact your website. And it allows you to target, to change major blocks of text and images without doing any coding to your website based on where the person is. So if you look at the video, so if I'm like looking on my computer and I am in Hong Kong, like literally the website changes and says like alumni opportunity, alum, meet alumni in Hong Kong, like event coming up, Hong Kong success stories. Like it's, it's really phenomenal and they have, and they can, you can target it down to, you can do it by, you know, by postal code, but you can do it, you can draw it on a map. So if you want to get really creepy, I know you like German audiences love this kind of creepy stuff, but you could you could target a specific high school or college. You know, you could say like right there, I'm going to put a testimonial of someone from that university when somebody from that university looks at it. And that is like it literally takes you 5 seconds. You just draw a picture on your website and say I want to replace this with this. It's weird. This is from HubSpot. I don't, know if, I don't know if you're allowed to use Hub. Does I, is anybody use HubSpot here? Or is that another data problem? <laughs> Any email software management, customer relationship management software, will allow you to, you know, will force you basically to segment. And HubSpot, they have a lot of videos online about market segmentation and emails. HubSpot is really good because basically what it says is 
You have, they make you come up with personas, or you can come up with personas, which means that then when I get an email from your university, even if it's the first email that just says, we got your question, we're going to get back to you within 24 hours, it could be different whether I'm segment one or segment two, whether I'm the engineer or I'm really interested in research. In the meantime, here are all of our engineering programs for you to look at. Or in the meantime, here are, some, here are our, our major research focus areas. And you basically force the people, you find out what segment they're in by asking them a couple of questions, generally, or you change it based on their geography. Everyone's looking really overwhelmed right now. You don't have to do all of this. It's just like the opportunities are out there to begin to do it. That, like, as if I, I already said you looked overwhelmed, but this is like, this is kind of what you need to think about, and this goes back to your question. How do you, how can, what do you need to know to decide what, how to prioritize? How can you reach them? When can you reach them? What messages really resonate with each of the segments? What product should be developed for them? That's, that would be a, a novel approach, right? To actually say, hey, what I'm noticing is that when, and this is actually something that Eat Says could do, what we really need is a program in mechatronics or whatever. Like I'm seeing a lot of interest right that now in, in my market. Just gonna pass that back on to the universities. What features can you add to a product to make it more attractive to the market segment? So someone who's very career focused, a feature, for example, for a summer program could be an internship, a work experience, or an opportunity to visit companies, right? So there's like features that, that you, as, you as international people could theoretically even talk to the departments and say, this is what we're hearing. This would make this much more attractive if you offered this. And then what will you do to measure and improve your results on an ongoing basis? So again, like the, we, you know, we've talked about this in a pretty like structured way, but I think, I hope that even having this like in your minds, you start to approach it a little bit differently. And I think that the way that I look at it is that it gets, it actually gets messy before it gets clear. Like you have to, like you literally have to sit down and think about this stuff and write it on a whiteboard and talk with colleagues and whatever and then get overwhelmed by all of the different audiences and how are you gonna prioritize it and how would you even know? And, and then you start chipping away at it until it gets clear again. Because the truth is it's already messy. We're just not acknowledging it as messy. We're acknowledging it as hard. You know, we're like, this is difficult to reach the students. We're having a difficult time reaching the students, but it's because it's kind of messy. So my million dollar question, now, with all of this new and exciting knowledge about Jim and John and all the rest of them, how would you spend a thousand dollars and and ten hours of your time tomorrow to improve your results? And please let the answer be something related to the target audience you just spent the last hour <laughs> talking about. And if the 10 hours is, I got to spend more time researching, how do I reach people in India? I got I to gotta schedule a, a meeting with the Itse person in India. I've got to like talk to other colleagues who I know are working in India. Then that's 10 hours. That is the right way to spend that time. And maybe you don't even need to spend any money. So, and I put this picture of my exciting new house that I moved to in August because it is so hot today that I wanted us to end on a very cooling note. <laughs> and see, you don't make a, see, everybody hears I'm from New York and they don't picture that, right? Because I lived in Brooklyn for the last 18 years also. So anyways, we have some, we have a couple minutes for questions and um, I hope this was more informative than overwhelming. You guys, you guys literally look like this right now. <laughs> and I hope it's just, the, I hope it's just the heat. <laughs> Anyways, just walk backwards out of the room. <laughs> Hello? Ah, doch. Cool. Um, well, Georg Verein from uh, the Information Center in Bangkok. And, uh, well, most of the time I thought, okay, well, um, pff, 
how do I, I mean, I'm not even selling shoes. I'm a, a sho <laughs> selling a shopping mall. Um, so, um, well, but w what I thought, especially at the end, is that actually there is lots of very useful information in these uh, Bildungssystemanalysen. You may have noticed they changed their name. Um, and, uh, well, we, we try actually to describe what the demand is in those countries. I mean, it could be probably more professional that you just type in, hey, I want to sell engineering degrees in Southeast Asia, and it pops up with, hey, go to mm -hmm. Malaysia. But, but um, well, it, we're not there yet. So you, you would have to click through the different country reports, and um, pretty much at the end you'll find uh, remarks on what actually students come and ask for, and what the main obstacles are for those students, and... Um, well, probably where you can reach them. And, and if that's not enough, of course, we're very happy to help with that. So that's, that's what I can provide, at least in that context. Yeah. Thanks. And DAD has a lot of great resources. And a lot of the companies, like study portals and things, are also producing reports that are free and publicly available that talk about student decision making. But I think we had a question here in the middle. She's coming around. I Stefan from uh, PFH Göttingen. Um, you, you showed us a slide um, with uh, the four different um, segments. Um, I think the University of Queensland wasn't. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And s in some cases, uh, students would probably belong to two or perhaps more of these segments. So my question is, on, on the website itself, to what extent would you go? Would you, um, for example, if you clicked on um, those in, in their 12th year in Australia, for example, um, and then they click on that. And then would you further segment it on the web page itself and, and into diff further categories um, uh, on I'm the web page? I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, so because what, what that reminds me to say, which is very important, is that we think of a website like this, like they go to the home page and then they go here and then they go here and then they go here. But what happens is they type into Google and they end here. That's usually what happens now. So it doesn't, it doesn't happen in a very linear way, which means that you have to look at the user pathways in a bunch of different ways. And I've talked about this a lot in the past, you know, y yesterday and today in the website checks that that means that you have to repeat information sometimes. So yes, absolutely. If it says like you're doing year 12 in Australia, but you might be interested in doing a short term program or something, well, that one probably that probably is not available to those guys, but if, if something overlaps, then when you get there, the next thing probably should just be a nice entryway into where, where you go next. But it depends, on, it, de it, it, de it depends on knowing those segments. So if we go back to that, like, well, so actually, I don't, I don't think these would overlap because this is international students completing year 12 in Australia, completing year 12 in their own country, transferring to UQ from another university, or spending one or two semesters. So in this case, they wouldn't necessarily overlap, but they do overlap because you're like, just within the segments, you're a, a woman and a casual soccer player who likes to have cute shoes to go to a cafe. You know, you're not... One of, just one of those things. So you, you need to think about the pathways as being, I mean, you could, if you had Google Analytics, which most of you do not have, you could, you could actually see how they go, you know, see if people go from here and then click on the other segments or not. If you, if you don't have that, then just think about where are all the important places these people are gonna look for the information and make sure it's easy to find it. And you almost always, on each page almost, until you get to an individual program page, you're basically continuing to segment. You know, you're like, are you bachelor's, master's, or PhD? Okay, great. And bachelor's, are you, do you need a program in English? Okay, great. These are, these are just segments. You know, you need a program in English. Okay, great. You need, do you want our bachelor's in business, or do you want our bachelor's in finance, or do you want our bachelor's in political science in English? Okay, great. And by the time you get to the bachelor's in political science, you could still segment and say, do you want to go on and do a PhD and be an academic in political science? Do you want to you know, work at an NGO? Do you want to work in Germany? So each of these pages is actually all about getting 
people where they need to go based on these characteristics. I don't know if that makes it more or less confusing, but. Oh, there's a question back there. Oh, it's 11.49 now, so if we'll do maybe, anybody who has to leave should go, because I understand there are trains and things, but we'll do one more. Stay for a couple more minutes. Well, thanks so much for your inspiring talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I was wondering about print uh, advertisement. I don't know whether you know that there's going to be a magazine um, by the Zeit uh, in cooperation with the DAD, which is uh, published in September, I think, and it will be uh, put on display in the ICs all around the world in the Goethe Institutes. So do you think, because we have our f very first ad, I'm from Philips University Marburg, so we have our very first printing ad, and we paid a lot of money for it, and we are not experts, so we just concentrated on our master's programs, which are taught in English, so that's our segment, actually. Do you think it's a promising approach to get the attention of international students, because it's printed and it's put on display in actual officers? Is it still up to date or what should we concentrate on? Because you talked a lot about websites, right? Yeah, no, print, print, is still, print is still very relevant for international recruitment, whether or not international students see a specific ad in a specific magazine, in an EATSA office, is a harder question to answer. That may actually be seen more by multipliers, though, who are still relevant, but that's exactly, that's exactly the point is that I would say, I would decide who that ad has to target and be as specific as possible. So you could actually say this ad's only gonna be for multipliers and say like, tell your students about our, you know, your bachelor student about our 12 master's programs taught in English. You know, so it's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard one to answer. Um, you won't be able to track it as much unless you used a landing page with a unique URL, but it, it depends. I know that's a bad answer, anyways. On that note, since everyone is, okay, I'll let everybody go and say goodbye, because I know you guys are too German and polite to all <laughs> leave, though. Thank you. And I'll still stick around for a minute if you want to talk. <laughs> Thank you, guys.